If you have your Bible, we also have it up on the screen, but if you have your Bible, open up to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Very glad to see everyone uh, here this morning. Um, we know obviously it's Easter and, and a lot of people come out on Easter, we, but we thank you that you, that you uh, are joining us this morning because you could be many other places, but you said, you know what, I want to be at church, I want to hear how the Lord resurrected and uh, came about that. So Mark chapter 16, we're going to start at verse 1, we're going to go to uh, verse 8. The Bible reads, and when, uh, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, uh, the mother of James, and uh, Salome had brought sweet spices that, uh, that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said, uh, and they said among themselves, Who shall uh, roll, roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they, uh, they looked, they saw that uh, the stone was rolled away, and it, for it was very great. And entering in, uh, into the sepulcher, they saw a young man uh, sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye see Jesus of Nazareth, which, uh, which was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go your way, uh, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth be, uh, before you into Galilee. There shall he see him, and, he's, uh, and as he has said unto you. Verse 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would fall upon fertile soil. Lord, that, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would give me, uh, you would, uh, give me boldness, and Lord, and uh, it would be as a fire shut up uh, in my bones. And Lord, we ask that this morning that you, Lord, would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So throughout the Bible, God used angels to make special announcements to humans uh, all, throughout, uh, all throughout Scripture. He used an angel to send a message to the destruction uh, uh, to Lot in Sodom in uh, Genesis 19. He, had, uh, he used an angel to announce the birth of Samson in Judges chapter uh, 13. He, uh, uh, he used an angel to announce the birth of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. He used an angel to announce the conception of, of Christ in Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 11. He used an angel to announce the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. But it seems, you know, so it seems that God, when he has an important message uh, that he will send, oftentimes he will send a, a message through an angel. From reading the, the Bible, it, it kind of makes us wonder if at any time the angels get a you know, time off or the Lord gets a day off, I'll let you know this, the Lord doesn't take a day off. He never does. But in our text, we are presented with an angel that made an announcement that still echoes throughout the universe almost 2,000 years later. It is this special message from that Easter angel that I want us to consider this morning. The title of my message this morning is The Message of the Easter Angel. The Message of the Easter Angel. On that first uh, Easter morning, as dawn was breaking on the world, that it would, uh, the world would be forever changed. A special angel delivered a, a special message, a message that is still vital today. Let's take just a few moments to hear the, uh, this message of the, uh, the Easter angel. I want to give a little bit of you know, context. I mean, think about this. The portion of scripture that we just read, think about all the stuff that just went into those eight verses. The fear and dread at first that, that filled the hearts of these, this little band of women you know, that went over there to, to make their way so, you know, in the still dark streets of Jerusalem early on that Sunday morning. They were going to the tomb of the man that they had all believed to be the Messiah, right? They had all believed that he was the Son of God. The man for whom they had left all other things behind. They were going uh, to the tomb of a man who promised life to all who came to him but who was now himself dead. 
Certainly they were confused and confounded as they came near to the tomb. They were also concerned about the huge stone that covered, uh, that covered the door you know, uh, to the tomb. How would they ever gain access to the body? How could they, uh, these three women ever hope to move a stone that weighed several hundred pounds, perhaps thousands of pounds? Yet they proceeded, carried along by, uh, by their mission that of, of, fi- of finishing the preparations for the burial of Christ. See, they were under the assumption. All right, like I said, as I said before, they didn't realize that Jesus Christ had, uh, you know, that he had rose from the dead. Their assumption was what? That he was still dead, that his body was there. They were going to prepare him, his body for burial. They were going there uh, for these They didn't know. We know the end of the story. You go, well, yeah, he resurrected. And some of us, we take that for granted because we hear about a resurrected Christ. We hear about somebody who raised from the dead, and we automatically go, yeah, I heard that before. They didn't hear it before. It hadn't happened yet. And sometimes we take that for granted, don't we? Sometimes we get a little bit too focused on the Easter bunny, don't we? Which amazes me that we get you know, so excited about a, a bunny that seems to somehow or another give out eggs. How those eggs come about, I have no idea. I don't want to know. So they're, they're, uh, they're concerned about the fact of, of, this, of, of, of that stone being in front of them, how they're going to get in, how they're going to do all this. So, but as they come within the sight of the tomb, they were astounded to see that the stone was rolled away. Now here's the other part you got to think about. If you walk up and the thing is, is that all the controversy that has surrounded Jesus, and Jesus did ha- create a lot of controversy, despite what the world says, he created a lot of controversy. You walk up and you see that, to- uh, that stone rolled away, what is their first reaction? Most likely, the, you know, they probably think that the, the Roman guards maybe had went in there and took the body, so that way there was no other way, you know, that somebody, you know, couldn't, you know, uh, fake a resurrection, right? But they walk up there and it's not that. They walk up there and they see the Roman soldiers laying on the ground like they're dead men at that tomb. Why? We'll see here in a moment. So seeing this, they run to the tomb, they look in, only to find that the body of Jesus, uh, Jesus is gone. What fear must have gripped their hearts because they're going, you know what, we came over here to prepare his body for burial and the body is gone. Where did it go? Perhaps they feared that, uh, you know, that the Jewish rulers, or like I said, the Romans had taken the body to prevent his disciples from faking his resurrection. Maybe they suspected that grave robbers had taken the body and would use it in some sort of like extortion plot. I don't know. Whatever the doubts or concerns that may have filled their hearts, they, uh, they are often, uh, obviously, they were short-lived. Why? Because suddenly the women noticed a young man sitting upon the stone. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 and 3, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. This angel sees their fears and begins to speak to them, in doing so, he delivers a message of hope that is still has the power to change lives this morning. So for a moment, let's listen and hear for ourselves that message of the Easter angel. Number one is this. It is a message of peace. It is a message of peace. In, uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 6, the first part of this says, Be not affrighted or be not frightened. Don't be afraid. The, the fear that the ladies must have felt uh, seeing an angel, because every single time in Scripture when somebody sees an angel, they fall down before him. It's never a thing of, oh, that's an angel. It's always the fact that fear captivates their hearts because of the fact that here's a holy being in front of them, and they bow down, and oftentimes the angel will say, you know what, stand up. Why? Because they don't want people to worship an angel. They don't want to take that, uh, have that position. But what grace that fills the first words from his lips are words of peace. Yet, this is how the Lord always deals with his people. Always. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
God does not want you to be afraid. If you have fear, you have anxiety, all those things, the Bible says to cast your cares, cast your anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. So for those people that sit there and are constantly afraid of the Lord, that somehow the Lord's going to, you know, if they're a believer in Christ, you know, they, they believe in him, and God will instantly bring peace. If it is not of God, you're going to constantly have that fear. You're going to have that anxiety. Why? Because it's not of the Lord. God does not give you a spirit of fear, as it says, but of power of love and of a sound mind. It is very appropriate that his resurrection should be attended with a message of peace because after 2,000 years, his resurrection from the dead is still bringing the same message of peace to the hearts of all that would believe upon him. If you have believed upon him, if you're saved, it brings peace to you when you hear the word of God. Notice just a few verses, you know, a, a few of the areas of life where his, rex, his resurrection gives you peace. In salvation, he gives you peace. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, uh, come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. What does the Bible say? That he not only, he not only saves most of you, he not only saves a little of you. No, the Bible says he saves you to the uttermost, he saves you completely. There's nothing that you can do that would unsave you once you're saved. He says, I will save you to the uttermost. And God doesn't lie. He cannot lie. When God says that he will give you everlasting life, he will give you everlasting life if you would believe upon him. And it's eternal life. That, what does that mean? That you can't mess it up. Isn't that an awesome thing to hear? That you can't mess it up. Because if it was up to me, I would mess it up. I would mess it up. Here's another area in life, uh, you know, his resurrection gives us peace. In death. You say, how can death give me peace? John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26 says, that Jesus said unto her, says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall what? Never die. Believest thou this? Or do you believe this? In other words, he's saying, you know what? Yes, you're going you're to die, but it's going to be for a moment. That as soon as you breathe your last breath, it's not like all of a sudden you're, you're just like waiting for a while. No, the Bible says that, you know, it says right here, it says that when you have died, what's going to happen? immediately you're going to go into eternal life. But the other side is true, that if you have not believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not put your trust and your faith in him, what happens to you is the fact that you will have everlasting damnation, you will have everlasting hell. And that's not something that, you know, all of a sudden you're just laying on the ground and one day that's going to happen. No, it's immediate. You just transition from this life to the next. But praise the, Lord, uh, praise the Lord that if you believe on him, that if you put your faith and your trust in him, the Bible says you have everlasting life and you cannot lose it. Amen? Does not that, does not that bring you peace? His resurrection gives peace in eternity. As I mentioned earlier, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He not only says, you know what, you can have everlasting life. He says, I prepare a place for you. He says, in my house are what? Many mansions. You know, you see, you know, you see all these ones out here. The people are always like, you know, fighting and clawing and saying, I got to have a big house. I got to have a mansion like these celebrities. It ain't going to compare to anything that the Lord Jesus Christ has prepared for you. Amen? And this is a house that you aren't, you're not going to have to worry about keeping maintenance upon. Why? Because it's, because God has prepared it for you. It's an amazing thing. And here's the thing is, John wrote, the, obviously, the Gospel of John, but John also got a glimpse of, of Jesus Christ. And you know what? And he, and he thought it was pretty good. You know, he thought, he, thought it was, he thought it was pretty amazing. You know what? 
Jesus Christ is alive today. We often just celebrate you know, the, uh, the resurrection of Christ on Easter. We should celebrate that life every single day. Why? Because he's alive and he's waiting on his children to come home. He's waiting on his children to come home. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 through 18 says this. It says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment uh, down, to, uh, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a, a, a golden uh, girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were, aflame, were as a flame of fire. And his feet looked at, uh, as unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had uh, in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun uh, shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, this is John speaking. He says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Sound familiar at the tomb? Are those Roman soldiers? And he says, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, this is Jesus Christ, saying, Fear not, I am the first and I am the last. I am he that lived and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ did not just die upon the cross. He, he descended into hell to do what? To pay for your sins. For three days, he, uh, he went down and he got the, the, the keys from hell and death and the grave. And you know what? Because of that, he resurrected and we can have new life. God has, has resurrected you not only through the fact that he paid for every single sin that would happen in this life. Your past, your present, and your future sins are forgiven. Amen? Does that not give you peace? It, I hope it does. It should give you peace. It should give you peace. He also gives us peace in life itself. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18 says this. And I will pray of the Father, and he shall give you another, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In this life, what did he do? He sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with you, to bring you comfort and to bring peace. That is the reason why, you know, for those in here maybe that have not believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you wonder why your Christian friends all of a sudden can have all kinds of turmoil, all kinds of tribulation in life, all these things in life, all these storms happening, and in the midst of that storm, they have peace. And you say, how can that be? Their life is a wreck. Everything's going on. Why? Because they have the comforter. That's how. I don't know about you, uh, you know, about you this morning, but those things give me true peace of heart. It is not only a message of peace, but it is also a message of power. Number two, it is a message of power. Why? Verse six, the latter part of it says, "He is risen. He is risen. He's not dead." He's not Buddha, he's not Muhammad, he's not Confucius, he's not all these other false religions. They're dead in the grave. My God is alive. He is risen. He is risen. We sang about this this morning. He is the resurrected king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus, you know, here's the thing is that oftentimes people think that he was the first man that was ever resurrected from the dead. But the thing is, is that Jesus wasn't the first man to get up from the grave. Why? Lazarus. Jesus Christ brought him back to life. The, widow, uh, the widow's son in Luke chapter 7, Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5, he brought them all back to life, but he was the first ever to raise himself up from the grave. Here's the thing. Jesus Christ raised them from the grave, but you know what? How many of you know that you cannot raise yourself from the dead? The only one that can raise you from the dead or that can raise you up is Jesus Christ. That is the only one who has the power to do that. He is the, and the, the first to ever get up and die no more. He never died after that point. Why? He had to die to purchase our salvation. To be that, 
that offering for sin that was for, you know, for a perfect, sinless person. And he was the only one. I know that you may think, you know what, my spouse is perfect. Or my kids are perfect. I'm sorry they're not. There is only one perfect person, and that is Jesus Christ. And you're not him. But how many of you are glad that you're not him? I know I am. Because he was able to conquer death, all those who uh, receive him as their Savior become partakers of that same resurrection power. The Bible says that the same power that raised him from the dead raised you to, uh, to new life. At that very moment of salvation, his, resurre- his resurrection is imputed or it is given to us and we become alive in him when we believe upon him. I don't know about you, but that is power, isn't it? That is that life abundant that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 10. He said he wants to give you life and life abundant. I'm not talking about the fact that you say, you know what, I don't know if I want any more life because this life doesn't seem the best. That's not what he's talking about. He said, I want to give you life and life more abundant. He gives you eternal life. And he gives you a better life than you ever had. I've often heard that people have said that Christians are like these, you know, these funny duddies. They never have any more fun. They have no fun. They just don't do anything. They don't have any fun like myself. And I sit there and say, you know what? I don't know about you, but if your definition of fun is like drinking and having your head in the toilet, I don't know about you. I don't ever like it when I'm sick and my head is in that area, let alone the fact that you'd be saying, you know what, I want to go out and do that to myself so my head can end up in there. I don't like it when I'm sick, let alone when I'm, you know, when a person, you know, if I were to drink and have that happen. That's not fun to me. When I have my head in the toilet, I don't go, woohoo! That's not fun. Or the fact that, you know, that, you know, uh, you know uh, just people saying they're having fun doing all these different things. I, don't, I have more fun now that I'm saved than I ever had in life. Ever. Because the thing is, is that I have that peace. I have that power in, the, in my life that Jesus Christ had, it has imputed to me that I am no longer dead in my sins. I am alive in Christ. Amen? Amen? All this... Uh, all this great resurrection you know, power will, all, uh, will be ultimately recognized when Jesus returns, and he is returning. And, you know, and he will raise the dead in Christ. Actually, the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So if you have a, you know, a grandma that you remember, and you said, man, you know, she was a great woman of God, or uh, you know, an aunt or an uncle or your dad or your mom or whatever, you know what? They're not going to stay in the grave. One day, when Jesus Christ breaks the eastern you know, sky, he's going to call those home. He's going to, you know what? He's going to take all those home. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And if you're not saved at that moment, it's too late. It's too late. Imagine all those departed saints, as I said, resurrected from the dead, and glorified to live forever with Jesus Christ, with God. What a, a day that will be, and it's not just to do justice. You think you see those things on the news all the time right now, and you say, you know what, there is no justice in this world, and there's not. The only time you'll see justice is when Jesus comes, uh, comes back, and he will, he will judge both the just and the unjust. Those who have believed on him and those who have not. If God's people will take the time to look around and, and see what the Lord has, has done in saving the lost and changing the lives of the redeemed, it becomes plain that the resurrection power of the Lord, uh, Lord Jesus is active all around us today. Every redeemed sinner is a testimony to the life-changing, the life-giving power of the risen Christ. Every single person in here that you know as a believer is a testimony. And you say, well, you know what, some of them don't give a good testimony. Sometimes that happens. But don't sit there and try and blame it on the Lord. How many times I've heard a person say, I can't go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites. And you're not? You'll be right, you're welcome with all of us in here. Because we all do hypocritical things. We all say hypocritical things. You know why? Because we're all sinners. The only difference between me and somebody who's not saved is the fact that I believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am a sinner. 
I still sin, and the only time that I, I won't and I'll stop is when I get up into heaven and I get my glorified body and I'll no longer be that way. Amen? After all, you know, a dead man doesn't have the power to change anyone, right? But a, a living Lord can work miracles in, a, in any wrecked and ruined life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Your life that you once you know, was messed up and whatever, now is brand new. That does not mean that the consequences that you made prior to this all of a sudden vanish. How many of you know that? We still live in this life. There's still consequences for the things that we've done. If you, uh, like I said, if you abuse your body, you've done all these, you know, uh, things to your body, your body does not, this body does not all of a sudden just get brand new again. You know, I, I told this to my wife, you know, and, and I said it, you know, several times, and, I, uh, you know, you guys heard this, the ones that come here every week have heard this. It seems like, I'm just telling you right now, I turned 40, and people say, oh, you just go over the hill, and you just whatever. No, somebody pushed me, and that's, and that's a pretty steep hill, I'll tell you that right now. Because every time, you know, any time that I get a cold or a sickness or anything in my body, I say, Lord, I, I am looking forward to the day that I get my glorified body. That I will have no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, nothing in there like that in my life. But there will be joy everlasting. Amen? Not only is it a message of peace and power, but it is also a message of potential. In verse 6 again, it says, he is not here. He is not here. After Jesus rose from the dead, he immediately disappears and appears to, uh, to be busy doing something important. His appearance to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, Jesus forbids Mary from touching him that morning. Why? Because he was on his way to the Father. As the great high priest, Jesus would be the one required to make the offering of blood upon the mercy seat, upon the altar that would atone, that would pardon your sin and the sins of the whole world. You say, well, if God has pardoned the sins of the whole world, then why do I need Jesus? He's already done it. No, the fact is, is that he's made that opportunity available to you, and, but you need, to, uh, you need uh, to take that action in believing upon him. If you have never believed upon him, if you never put your faith and your trust in him, then you're still not saved and you have not accepted that gift that he gave you. And let me I'll tell you this, it is a free gift. The Bible says that those who would believe get eternal life. It's not the fact of you repenting of all your sins. Because here, let me ask you this question. Has anybody in this room or anyone that's listening ever turned away from every single sin in their life? Has anybody ever turned away from all their sins? And you say, well, yes, I have. That means you're perfect. You're not perfect. We discussed this earlier. It's not the fact of whether or not you get water baptized. It's not the fact of church attendance or any of those things. Believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. The Bible says it's grace, it's by grace through faith that you are saved. All those other things are good. Going to church is good. Being baptized in water is good, right? Turning away from sin is a good thing. But that will not get you into heaven. It is belief upon the Lord Jesus Christ that gets you to heaven. He accomplished everything by shedding blood upon the cross. Then uh, he would conquer uh, the grave and death and hell by descending into hell to pay our debt for our sin. And finally, resurrecting himself. And as I said before, nobody in this world has the power to resurrect themselves. The only one who could do that is God. And that's who Jesus Christ is. And because he resurrected himself from the dead, he did that so he could pass, you know, he could make it possible for us to pass from death unto life, from eternal damnation to everlasting life to eternal life. He made it all the way possible, but you have to accept that gift. How many kids in here on Christmas morning or on your birthday have a whole, say it's your birthday, you have a whole table full of presents? For those that were here last night and saw all the Easter baskets up here, how many of you, you know, last night, if you were like looking at all those Easter baskets that were up here, and we're going, don't these look great? 
And you're like, yeah, I want one. I want one. You're like, nope, sorry, you got to go home. Or the fact that you have all, you know, all the presents on, you know, on the table for your birthday. And you say, you know what, I, I just I don't really want those presents. What child in here would ever turn down a present? Would you turn down a gift? Or on Christmas morning, you, go, you, you run downstairs and you see all the presents on the tree, you're like, you know what, I'm good. But that's what we do with the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us a free gift, free a salvation, eternal life, and oftentimes we say, you know what, I'm good. I don't need that. I don't want to do that. And the, the sad thing is that for most people, they say, I don't want to do it because, you know, perhaps, now think about this when you make this statement, I don't want God, you know, changing my life. I don't want to have a newness of life. I don't want, you know, God to begin to tell me, you know, how, how I can change my life. Is your life that great that you're sitting there going, yeah, I just want to keep on doing what I'm doing? And people will sit there and say, I, I, I just don't want to, I mean, to me, Man, I tell you, I'll tell you what, when I was a kid, and even now, Christmas morning, I'm tearing up some presents, I'm telling you, I'm opening them up, I, I want that gift. Am I the only one? Yeah, see, Doc, I got Doc over here, you know, he said, he said no way, you know, he's like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be tearing them up too. The work of the, you know, work of the risen Lord obviously is forever finished. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one, uh, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now think about that statement. It says, after he had what? Offered one sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, they would offer sacrifices all the time, and that was only a foreshadowing. That actually didn't even take care of their sin. That was only to show what, they, you know, what their sin cost them. But on here it says what? It says he had offered... One sacrifice, because you know what? God's good enough. He says, we'll offer one sacrifice for sins. How long? A couple of minutes? Maybe an hour? A week? No, I believe it says forever. How long is forever? Forever. How long is eternity? Forever. How many of you know how long forever is? I don't know, but it's, I'm going you know, to try and find out. Oh, I will find out. However, you know, uh, you know, don't think for a moment that Jesus Christ is not busy this morning. He's, you know, like I said earlier, here he is still alive. He is still active on our behalf. The thing is, is that if you say, you know what, I don't want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, he still speaks to you. He wants you. He desires you. Do you think he would have went to the cross and died for, you know, died for you? I mean, he would have died for you even if you were to turn your back on you. Why? Because that's how much he loves you. Jesus, I mean, Jesus Christ is acting as your intercessor. He goes on behalf for you. He intercedes for you. When you don't know what to pray, what to pray he prays for you. Isn't that awesome? He's always watching over us. He feels our pain. The Bible says that he was attempted at all points and yet was sinless, right? He went through everything that, you know, that we go through. He is more concerned about our affairs than we are. God is more concerned about your life than you are. I mean, think about it. There's a man in, in, uh, in the book of, Acts, in, uh, books, uh, book of Acts chapter 7. He's getting stoned. Big rocks being hurled at this man. Why? Because he said he believed on the Lord and everything else. And what ends up happening is that the Bible says that, you know what, that he stood up when Stephen was stoned and the needs of the people literally moved heaven, that God stood up along with the angels and saw him and welcomed him into heaven. There's a reason why when you have you know, your grandmother, she's lying on her deathbed and she's known the Lord for all of her life and all of a sudden she begins to see things that you don't understand. That happened with my grandmother. She was ushered into heaven. She saw the Lord. There's other people in my life that were on their deathbed, and literally they saw the Lord, and the Lord would take them, and you say, I don't understand that. You will when you're a believer. He's acting as our advocate. He goes, 
you know, he goes before us. He's preparing a place for us, as I read earlier. He's waiting for the Father to send him after his children. After, when he comes back, like I said, there's, no, there's not a second chance. When he comes back, that's your, that, this life is your second chance. Not only is it a message of peace and power and potential, it is also a message of promise. The Bible says, ye shall see him, or you shall see him. The angel closed his message to, the, uh, to these women by reminding them of the Lord's promise. They were, that they would see him again. This word from the Lord, obviously, you must have lifted their hearts. That they had come to the tomb that morning expecting to see a dead body. They left it with the promise that they would look, uh, look upon his face again. Can you imagine their excitement? The Bible says that they trembled as they went. That they trembled. And they were afraid. Can you imagine the fact that you thought you're going there and you're literally thinking you're going to see a dead body, but the body's not there. And the thing is, is that they had that promise of seeing the Lord again. My friends, this morning, they don't have a thing on us. We may not be able to see the risen Lord there in Galilee, but we have the promise that we may be... uh, but you know what? We may be uh, just a little bit better. Why? Because, you see, we too shall see his face, but not in Galilee, but in glory. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4 says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. We shall see him again. Just because we never saw him, you know, as far as here, the Bible says that we are blessed because, you know what? We have believed and yet have not seen him. In fact, we will see him, first of all, like I said, when the rapture happens. What do I mean by the rapture? We will see him, first of all, in the clouds above the earth returning in glory. Then we will see him ruling this, uh, this earth as king of kings and lord of lords. Then we will see his face forever in all of his glory in heaven above. I said, I don't know about you, but this sinner saved by grace can't wait to see him face to face. Can you wait to see him? I long for that day. And there's been times, and that's not, that's not a death wish. Because, you know, I, I've said that, you know, a couple times to my daughter. And my daughter's like, you're not dying. You're, you're not allowed to die. I said, I don't have a death wish. It's not like, you know, that, that I'm like saying, okay, take me now. But I say, you know what, whenever the Lord says, come on home, I'm coming on home, and I'm going to be excited about it, amen? Because you know what? When God sees me, when I'll stand before him, he'll say, why should I let you enter in? I said, well, you know what? I shouldn't. But I believe that on the, I believe that on the Lord, I trusted in him to save me. And when you do that, The Bible says that he imputes or he clothes you in his righteousness, that God no longer sees your sin. Why? Because his son, Jesus Christ, has covered it. And you will say, enter in. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But if you've never done that, if you've never believed upon the Lord, he's going to say, you know what, depart from me. For I, what, never knew you. You may say to yourself, you know what, I said a prayer when I was a kid and whatever, but I don't, you know, I don't know. The thing is, is that, you know what, If you have believed on him, you are saved. But don't just do something because mom and dad are sitting next to you. Grandma and grandpa are sitting next to you. Maybe your auntie and your uncle are sitting next to you. Whoever it is, don't don't believe upon the Lord because they're a Christian. Believe on the Lord because why? Because you believe who Jesus Christ is. Let me tell you this. He is still the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, your past, present, and future sins. You sit there and say, well, I've done too many bad things. I've done, you know, uh, I, I don't think God could ever forgive me. Really? You don't think that God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who spoke this world into existence, can't forgive your sins? If that was the case, he would have never died for you. But he knew what it would take to, to, to be able to take care of your sins forever i'm telling you this heaven will be a wonderful place it's going to be a wonderful place because we will get to see him why i don't know 
because you know what? I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve Jesus Christ. I don't deserve those things. I don't. I'm being serious with you. I don't deserve those things. But God says, you know what? My mercy and my grace are sufficient for you. God says, you know what? Yes, you don't deserve it, but you know what? You're going to get what you don't deserve, which is heaven, which is Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. You will get something that you don't deserve. It is like a person, you know, it is like you standing before the judge. You've done all these crimes before him. You say, I'm, I'm sinful. I'm wicked. I deserve to go to jail. I deserve the death penalty and everything else. And someone that you don't even know comes in through the courtroom and runs in and says, you know what? I paid their debt. They're free. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. Will you this morning believe upon him? This, this, this Easter angel preached a pretty powerful message, don't you think? I mean, I'm personally convinced that this is the most important message ever delivered by an angel to humanity. I just praise the Lord this morning that I know Jesus Christ and I'm saved. Because it, it's not about me, it's about him. How about you? Do you know him? Let me, know, uh, let me tell you this. He is still saving souls today. If the Lord has not, you know, has not you know, broke the eastern sky and come back, you know what? That means you have that opportunity because it's not over. He's still saving souls. He's still blessing hearts you know, today. He's still fight, uh, filling his servants today. You say, how can this be? Why? We, re- we said it this morning. Because he lives. Because what the angel said is still true. He is risen. He is not here. To that I say glory to God. Do you need something from the living Christ this morning? Do you need some from, you know, something from Jesus? Do you need him to save you? Do you need his peace? Do you need his reassurance of that promise? If so, I say, come and get it. He lives for you. This morning, as as we uh, you know, as we come to the close of of the of the sermon and the the service, I'm going to have Tim you know uh, play some music. And for the next few moments, if you want to come forward, come forward. But if you don't, whatever you need, like I said, the Bible says cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast all your anxieties, all those things upon him. If you need to get saved, I will pray with you. I'll pray for you. But I want you to begin to look at your life and say, you know what? I don't have peace. Remember, God said he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to realize that power and that potential that you have. He wants you to realize and know the promise that he has given. As I said earlier, he is a God that does not lie. He tells you the truth. His word, you can bank on it. Whatever he says, you can sit there and and take it to the bank and say, you know what, it's going to happen. So for the next few moments, I want you to begin to think upon what, what has been preached this morning and say, you know what, what do I need from the Lord? Do I need to get saved? Do I need peace? Do I need those things in my life? The next few moments. Uh, uh,